ready to achieve great heights, then you're in the right place. Welcome to Power Your Performance, the podcast where we dive deep with leaders in the gaming world and beyond and learn the techniques they use to power their lives. I am your host, Gary Kleinman. John Davidson, welcome to Power Your Performance. Thanks for having me. It is, it is great to actually have somebody in person and not looking at a screen in, in Zoom. You are known in the industry as a thought leader and basically an esports guru. Tell me about it. Thank you. Well, I was very fortunate to get my step in the space and uh, about five years ago. And if people would say, how do you get into esports? I couldn't tell them how to do it, how I got into it, because it was right place, right time. So, how did you get into it? I was a producer at a an agency called The Marketing Arm in Dallas. Sure. Cool. And the video game store uh, GameStop, which is the world's largest dedicated gaming retailer, uh, was, an a- was a client of the agency. And I was put on that team to bring partnerships with non-endemic brands. Like, for example, hey, Dr. Pepper, you're trying to reach gamers. You know, we have all this traffic on our website. We have this big loyalty program, et cetera. Let's exchange in-kind value and, you know... You'll reach more gamers. We'll extend our reach through your platforms, et cetera. Well, three weeks into that role, I had a really weird schedule. Four days at GameStop headquarters, one day at the agency headquarters, signing two different NDAs. I didn't know what I could share with my team. I didn't know what I could share with GameStop. Uh, The CMO um, had good vision, and he went to the head of uh, TMA, and he said, why don't we just hire John on full-time? And so started as head, head of GameStop Partnerships, Fantastic. fancy title for a big company, which helped the network. My first day onboarding, they said, John, in addition to partnerships, we want you to figure out esports for us. Did they have any background in esports at the time? So they had done some tournaments a long time ago um, when esports was much smaller or they're just selling games. Less awareness. They're basically just selling games, right? Yeah, and so uh, the market arm had, you know, kept saying, "Hey, esports is a thing. You need to have a strategy. You need to have a perspective on it. You, have, you need to have an understanding of how to approach this space." Because my role was so different than everybody else on the marketing team. They're basically doing channel marketing, right? Meaning, Call of Duty's coming out. How many social posts? Build a landing page. Send out X amount of emails. Right. My role was very outreach driven how would these partnership work etc and and more engagement driven in terms of actual in game engagement as opposed to awareness yeah i would say it was more a little more strategic okay you know not to put myself above anybody else on the marketing no, team just not. a different role but i i went to a conference called esports rising in los angeles okay And, you know, I was aware of esports, but I wasn't like, oh, I'm this guru, let me build your strategy. I was like, oh, let me figure this out and see what our approach is. So I went into this this conference. The who's who of the industry is there. Team owners, league operators, publishers, uh, non-endemic brands, etc. And the opening keynote, I don't remember who it was, but I remember his first sentence. What he said was, just a caveat on this whole conference, nobody has this figured out yet. Would you say that that's still true? I would say it's less true, but okay. I don't think it's completely figured out. Okay. But in my mind at that time, boy, just what went through my head was what an incredible opportunity. Yeah, isn't it? Uh, at what point will I ever come, os- come across a global competitive landscape in the growth phase that I can have a role in and help serve, support, and shape it in and nobody, some way. That nobody knew about or at the time, but 3 billion people are engaged, right, in gaming. And you're That's going, right. And nobody knows about it. It's like the world's best secret then. Yeah, and the, the biggest thing uh, is that it the, the number one revenue driver in esports is partnerships. Correct. Sponsorships. But the brands who are providing the dollars to the industry don't understand the community because they're more skeptical of advertising. Uh, just the, the structure of esports is very different from traditional sports. So there's all sorts of pieces of it that are confusing. And what's really cool to me is to look back way before my business career to see what has helped me most in understanding gamers right. is I have been a sponsored skateboarder since I was 14 years old. Oh, interesting. Okay. So I've been a brand ambassador my whole life. 
I grew up in a subculture, a counterculture that is far more skeptical of outsiders than gamers are. So when you come from any more any environment that's more extreme, you come to something else and it feels easy. Right. That right? It's like the athlete running up hills uh, to practice and then once they get on the football field, they're fast. Without a doubt. Right? So so that's five, six years ago, right? Right. So as you sit here today, what do you think is the biggest transformation or change in in the entire gaming landscape, including esports? Mm. So I would say let me list a couple. The first one I would say is uh, franchised esports. And what I mean by that is that over the last couple of years, uh, esports teams have become geographically located in a couple of different leagues. Correct. So right. specifically, Overwatch League and Call right. of Duty League, we've got the, uh, the Dallas Fuel in the Overwatch League. You've got the LA Thieves, right. Atlanta Fays in Call of Duty. And before that, there was no geographic tie. And it because partnerships is the number one source of revenue, you need to provide opportunities for these brands to have ROI Correct. so they complete continue to, to, fund. to fund. Right. If you want to do cool stuff, you need money. Right. Guess, who need, guess who has money? Brands, brands. have money. No Lots of money. But if they're going to put their money in your hands, you have to execute effectively because the reason – we sometimes in the gaming space, we think, oh – you know, you want to come in this space, you have to be authentic, you have to serve us, you have to support us, you have to do what we want. We, those things are true, and I agree with them, but that's not the whole conversation. The other side of the coin is the reason that brands sponsor something is because they will make more money than if they don't or if they sponsor something else. So we need... Or some of that also these days, the fear of missing out that a competitive brand will step in and they mm-hmm. won't be there. That's also true. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's a big one is how, um, you know, that has enabled more sponsorships. It's enabled uh, local brands to be part of esports rather than just global brands. Right. Um, there's also just been a maturing of the space overall uh, from a business perspective, uh, from a mindset as far as I think us gamers broaden our minds to things like health and wellness, right. you know, uh, which we'll talk about yeah, more. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, from a business perspective, I, one of my roles, I'm the chairman of the Esports Trade Association. Okay. And so what we seek to do there is to bring together the endemic esports industry alongside, I call them complementary experts. Okay. People who are not from the esports industry, but they have complementary knowledge and experience to provide to the industry to support more sustainable growth. Okay. And so what we see in the industry is there's a lot of young people who run the industry and that has pros and cons. The pros... A lot of energy, a lot of not knowing what you can't do. So a lot of innovation, you're not held back by we all, all always did it this way or we can't do that. Also, a great understanding of youth culture because it's them, right? The downside, experience. Right. There's no substitute Well, there's a gap. I mean, there certainly is a gap when agers age out. I mean, gamers age out, 23, 24, 20, whatever name, yeah, name you want to put. And then they want to go into kind of sort of corporate America or brand work or distribution, whatever it is. But they don't have the education, the background, or the experience. They don't understand a marketing plan. They don't understand a P&L. Mm-hmm. They don't understand engagements and metrics and everything else. But they want to be there, and, and generally speaking, with a good title. So, And I would say on the flip side is the people who understand the P&L, who have the experience, don't understand gaming. Without a doubt. So there's this gap. ESTA is that bridge. And so one of the um, things I've seen change in this space to your original question is, you know, being able to provide better data, having just better, simple business practices. It's not the right. sexy part. It's not going to go viral on Instagram. But what it is going to do is help you effectively run your business so you can become profitable one no day. No question. And it's foundational. And yeah. I think, you know, maybe you agree, disagree that – I think what's changing is the perception of a gamer. You know, for so many years, it was the acne-scarred kid on a couch yeah. in a dark room, antisocial, no friends, yeah. and understanding that it's the antithesis. It's actually incredibly bright social people, social in a different way, mm-hmm. STEM-based, um, yeah. and, and really athletically, you know, um, 100 and what 25 moves a minute or whatever the, the sure. recent stat is that's significant which is yeah you know kind of a good segue to they're all doing this where's health wellness and nutrition in yeah. gaming where has it been where is it now and where's the educational component because 
you're starting to see, at least from the, the medical pro, uh, professionals we deal with, carpal tunnel syndrome is coming really early. You know, sleep yeah. deprivation, anxiety issues. We had a you know conversation, unfortunately, yesterday uh, with some people about the depression in young kids, whether it's TikTok gamers or otherwise, mm-hmm. and the suicide rate. So where can the industry, where is it? Where should it be? And how do we help get it there to promote um, healthy people, not only in their gaming skills, but as we you know referenced earlier, uh, financially, emotionally, you know, socially, mm-hmm. to to really bolster themselves. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think there's you know one of the um, significant points is that everybody's a gamer nowadays. Right. So you still have the kids who are left out um, at recess who are gamers. But you also have Odell Beckham Jr., who's arguably the coolest person in the world, is a gamer as well. And everything in between, right? So everybody's a gamer, and the cool kids game, and the gamers are the cool kids right. now, right? It used to be the gamers were not the cool kids. Um, as far as where it is now, what I'm really excited about is to see kind of this maturing of the space, like I talked about earlier. But when you talk about health and wellness, we have people like uh, a good friend of mine, Taylor Johnson, um, who would be a great guest for you. Um, we'll make sure he comes on. Yeah. So he he has helped gamers understand from a mental aspect uh, and a physical aspect how to improve their performance. So, you know, mind and body is a big piece of it. So right. if you if you are a healthy person, if your body is healthy because you're eating right and you're exercising, your mind is going to work faster, Right. right? Reaction time is one of the biggest differences between a pro gamer and everybody else. It's it's insane. And so if your your mind is firing um, better, you're going to perform better. Uh, just the also the way that we train. So burnout is a big thing in esports and uh, with streamers, content creators. Is typically the way that you practiced is you just play for 14 hours a day. Now imagine if a football player. Oh, it's unrealistic. Was it's playing just, football. Totally unrealistic for right. them to do that. And so this is part of one of these things where you're maturing in the space is you're understanding, okay, let's go quality over quantity. Right. Is obviously playing the game is going to be part of what you need to do to practice. But there's a lot of other ways that you can practice or rest your mind no or question. enable yourself to recover better sleep, et cetera, that when you get on stage, you're going to perform at a higher level. Yeah, I'm assuming meditation is not big in the gaming space yet, you know, for calming. I mean, uh, I think it's coming. It's got to be coming. I'm, I mean, I hope, I hope it's coming because uh, without it, people are going to just age um, and not be the, be- the best version of, of themselves. And, yeah. I, you know, what, what we have found uh, is a lot of that is the younger gamers feel that they're invincible. So if something hurts, it just hurts. If they're tired, let's take a Red Bull, a Monster, or something else. You know, and then you can get into the Adderall issues, which we won't get into. But, I mean, it's part of, you know, that's detrimental. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other side, I think, has to change, um, and I'd love your perspective, is the hardware. Because, Mm -hmm. you know, the chairs, as cool as they are, are not ergonomically sound for 10-hour gaming sessions, Mm -hmm. right? Consoles and keyboards are, are... awful for for the angle of of your wrist. Right. So it'd be interesting to see if the hardware world yeah. catches up because of the scale of gaming. Yeah, and I, I think one thing I love about this space is in all sorts of ways, whether it's equality issues, where it's financial issues, where it's health and wellness, the esports space is one that when there are issues, the community confronts it. True. There's a lot of other industries or communities where if there's an issue, it's pushed to the back, it's hidden, or it's a, this is the way we've always done it, so be quiet. You know, one of the benefits of this being a young space is we haven't done anything for a very long right. time. That's true. And so also just, you know, Gen Z is just very, I don't know, very socially aware, uh, self-reflective and look to solve problems that are in the world. And so when you talk about the the hardware and the seats, you know, what comes to mind is uh, Herman Miller. So Herman Miller is an iconic furniture brand, Without right? Doubt. They recently came into the, the gaming space and they are providing these ergonomically correct chairs. Um, I think that brands that listen to market demand are the ones that are going to do best. And uh, 
when when you see that effect, when you see one company doing that, others are going to follow suit. Uh, Complexity Gaming is one that is located here in Dallas, uh, acquired by Jerry Jones and John Goff, and they focus all on player performance, health and wellness, exactly what your podcast is all about. And so they are, that is front and center in their mind, how they eat, how they practice, how they're sitting. Herman Miller, I don't know if they're still a sponsor, but was a sponsor, at least at one time, of them. I think when you look at HyperX Corsair Razor, it's absolutely in the interest of these brands no to question. set up gamers to game long term. And so things, I, I think what you see in our space is similar to most other industries. It's the maturation process of you go through this phase of there's awareness of a thing right. and then the issues are, you know, come to light. And then who confronts those issues are the, the brands that are going to win. I think the biggest difference between esports and traditional industries is that the community listens more and responds, is more vocal to brands. Yeah, I mean, the one thing when I got into gaming, I don't know, six, seven years ago, uh, and did a deep dive into gaming because I tripped across it um, as an owner of a marketing company of a young 17-year-old girl competing in a League of Legends tournament in Madison Square Garden. And they said 17,000 people were there. Wow. said, that's got to be a typo, right, seven years ago. And obviously it was not. <laughs> yeah. So when, when I did a deep dive to look at it from a marketing perspective, uh, my takeaway was that gaming is not about the game per se. It's about the community because games are transient, Big right? Time. So if you look at Fortnite several years ago, that's yep. all everybody talked about. It's still popular, but it's not what it is today, what it was five years ago. But the community is is tight. And, it's all about and, the community. Yep. And it's all about the community. And, and I don't think people realize how communal gaming is. And the yeah. perception seems to be it's just an individual sitting right. someplace gaming. And, and an interesting uh, question I have for you is w- I have found, at least from my personal opinion, that publishers have not done enough hmm. to communicate the value proposition of gaming. And I hmm. don't understand it, right? That it is communal, mm-hmm. it, the, that, that games are stories and there's conflict mm-hmm. and there's conflict resolution and there's art and there's yeah. music and, and, and there's sharing and there's mm-hmm. spatial awareness and all the things that go into gaming. And we can sit here for 45 minutes and, and, and talk about all that. But you don't see PSAs, right, from mm-hmm. um, publishers yeah. that, that bolster that. And it's always mm-hmm. seemed to me to be, as a consultant, why not? Why are they not professing the value proposition of gaming as opposed to just have their own perception of we just want to sell games? Well, I think it's because they sell a lot of games and they make a ton of money. And when you don't have to do something, you tend not to do it. But then you get to be Activision and look what's happened to Activision in the last two years, rightfully so. And that's been going on forever and ever and ever and a day. You would think from a perception standpoint, I mean, these are public companies. From a perception standpoint, it, it, it baffles me. Yeah, I think it's not uncommon with large companies, regardless of industry, that the leaders are not in touch with what's actually happening at the ground floor with the community, right? And so one thing that we see in the esports space is that the publishers basically own everything because they own the IP right. of the games. Right. If you and I wanted to start a football league, we could call it whatever we wanted. John's Football League. John's Football <laughs> League. We couldn't use the NFL logo, right. but we could play with the same rules, the same field, all of the things. It'd be if, a JFL logo. That's right. If right. we wanted to start a League of Legends league, we could not right. without the express consent of Riot Games, right. right? So what happens is below the publisher level, teams, schools, all of these things is not profitable. And that's a major challenge. And so when you talk about where my mind goes to your question is, okay, who can tell that message and who needs to? And specifically teams, because they need to figure out how to be profitable. And especially these geographically located teams, like I was talking about earlier, need to create fan bases. Without a doubt. And you're exactly right that that um, gaming is very communal. In fact, esports is more communal than broader gaming, because there are a lot of video games that are not competitive that you can right. play on your own. Right. Right. Esports, outside of fighting games, are 
team sports. Yes. Right? So you need all this communication. When I was at GameStop, when Fortnite came out, we saw headset sales skyrocket. Right. And, you know, people have this stereotype, this thought of the gamer and, you know, alone and being a loner. But if you think about community, one of the things that comes to my mind is E3, mm-hmm. is Comic-Con. Right. Right? This is a group of people. You know, if there was ever a group of people who did not need to be connected or to talk to each other, it would be gamers. Right. To get together in person, I should say. Because they can do everything from the comfort of their home, own homes. And they're very technologically savvy, all these things. But when you think about passion and you think about community, what comes to mind is people participating, dressing up, you know, so excited to get together in person. And that's what gamers are. So we are very communal, both online and in person. I was at the Overwatch Championships at the Barclays Center pre-COVID. Yeah. Um, and crazy. I mean, if you didn't know that there was a gaming, uh, the Overwatch was being played, you thought you were in an NBA game. It was yeah. up to the rafters and screaming. 20,000 like, people, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was insane. Absolutely insane. But we walked several blocks after in Brooklyn to, to get some dinner, and there was a table next to us, um, and everybody's wearing their Overwatch merch, right? Yeah. That's cool, whatever it is. Um, I want, So I talked to them. And, and the story was remarkable because the, the woman that was kind of hosting everybody had five or six other people, and they met, you know, online playing Overwatch. Yeah. She invited them to come to the finals in Brooklyn. They all were staying at her house. They just met three days yeah. before in person. The following day, she was giving them the, the standard New York tour of the Empire State Building cool. and, and what have you. They were going to be guests at her wedding the next year. Wow. And they met online through Overwatch. And that's not happening in football, basketball, hockey. You know, nobody's right. sharing Madden or something like that and ending up in Brooklyn. And and it, it struck me, as it does very often, that there is that communal uh, connectivity mm-hmm. that lasts for a very, very, very long time. And, yeah. and they get in great. And going back, I don't know why publishers, because that's a valuable social message Mm -hmm. for gatekeeper parents who say, I don't want my kids gaming. I I was fortunate to speak at the sports summit, um, uh, the sports nutrition summit in San Diego a couple weeks ago on esports and health wellness and everything else. And it was probably, not because I was speaking, um, a a pretty well attended or one of the most attended sessions because all these ingredient companies are trying to figure out what to put into products for gamers. And several mothers the next day came over to me and they said, thank you for what you said. My son's going to love you because I didn't realize Mm -hmm. the value in gaming. And then when you go and you you talk about, uh, we talked about this at dinner last night, that the Notre Dame Cathedral, part of it's being built because of the blueprint, I think, in Assassin's Creed, because there's not a blueprint for the the church. And that's the closest thing that they can get. And when you start hearing these stories, and you would just think that, you know, listen, the the 800-pound gorilla in gaming are Mm -hmm. the publishers. And why would they not uh, promote the value proposition? Because from a psychological health, wellness, nutrition perspective, that's valuable to those people that are going to buy their games. Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, I want to be fair to publishers. There's, you know, some that are doing that. But I think your point is this is the key value proposition, right? Um, I think it can be difficult from a... I, I see it from all sorts of different lenses. The community side, I've been part of big brands, I've been part of big agencies, so I'm kind of seeing it from everywhere. Right, which is why I want to ask you that question, because yeah. you've seen it from the brand side, you've seen it from the publisher, you've seen it from the retailer. Right. Right? I mean, and that's where ultimately, up until online, really kind of killed GameStop. Well, so you could say with game, I'll give you the GameStop example, is, you know, I would talk to everybody and they would say, why why can't you play video games in your stores, right? You would think the one place where you could go and you could sit down and play a video game would be GameStop, try and buy, right? Right. Play a game before you buy it, see if you like it. And uh, the stores were not big enough to do that. Right. And part of the reason why the stores weren't big enough to do that is because the the um, retail, the real estate strategy was to have very small stores that were very easy to move and they were all leased. So if you had to throw your GameStop store in the back of your Honda Civic and you move it across that. the street you for a better that. lease, you could do that. And that had great business implications, right. but it had very Good negative point 
community implications. Right. And so I think what you have there, and I love GameStop. I'm not, you know, a hater, but I'm just sharing some of the reality yeah. behind the scenes. Is at any business, you have to have your priorities. Correct. And the people who are setting those priorities are the C-suite. And the odds that people who have the experience or have been hired in a C-suite position, you're probably 60 years old, I'm guessing, 50, 60. The odds that you're 50, 60 and a gamer and that you're actively part of a community in gaming and you're also in the C-suite yep. at a Fortune 500 public company are low. Right. And so... The priorities you set are what you're aware of and what you view are important from a spreadsheet perspective. Sure. And so what I would do is just challenge leaders of publishers, but also of all brands. Spend time with your community. You know, spend more time oh, listening than but talking. Most of them don't. That's right. Yeah, you know, I had the opportunity to host a, a roundtable with Gary Vaynerchuk uh, during COVID. It was an awesome experience, and I was so excited to have the opportunity to ask him a few questions. One of the questions I asked him, I said, Gary, from my experience, with specifically with the gaming community, if you want to know what they want, what they want you to do with them as a brand for sponsorship, activation, etc., you can ask them, and they will tell <laughs> they you. They'll tell you. Why, why is this such a like, trailblazing idea? You know, it seems like common sense. And he said, John, let me just tell you, if you asked 100 CEOs to do this, 98 of them wouldn't do it because they think they know what they're doing. And so I think a lot of it, it's maybe it's not the sexy answer, but I think it's the true answer. It's human behavior across industry. Well, if what you're doing is working, why change it? Well, and yeah. also, I, I always said this. So when I joined GameStop, they're doing $10 billion annually in revenue. A lot of people would criticize GameStop, say, oh, you need to pitch it to div- digital or your blockbuster, this, that, and the other, right? I will say the, the business was far more complex and healthy than a blockbuster scenario. However, I always try to put myself in the, the seat of the founders. I'll tell you this. If I started a company that was doing $10 billion annually in revenue, you probably couldn't tell me I don't know what I'm doing either. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so... But, yeah, yes and no, because... A lot of companies are knocked off their perch. Every oh, right? it happens again and again. There's a beginning, middle, and end. Much like there are to the the game titles, there's a beginning, That's middle, right. and end, and and you have to start looking at the end at the beginning so that That's right. you're not there. So I've heard you know one of the great quotes is if you're not trying to cannibalize your business, somebody else is without a doubt. Right. So if you have a group of very smart people and they are trying to figure out, let me try to poke all the holes in our business, and then how can we fill those holes, right? Because what happens, it blows my mind. I'm a very common sense type of a person. I generally believe that if something should happen or likely will happen, it does, right? right? And so it completely blows my mind that we see again and again and again, there is a company that rises to the top, fails to pivot when they are in the point to take that next step, and then another company comes up and does that. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, So I don't think you can nail it down that one. But for this specific conversation with community and with gaming, um, I actually think I'm actually very impressed with Epic Games with Fortnite. Um, So many people tried to knock them off um, from when they, they hit their rise. And they have kept their finger on the pulse of the gaming community. Fortnite is more of a social media platform than it is even a game nowadays. You want to go hang out with your friends? Right. You know, you hop on your... your uh, They're cross-platform. They were one of the first that was that you could play with other people on different platforms. Right. And even Sony PlayStation tried to break them of that. And they said, we're not going to allow that. And the community broke Sony right. PlayStation. And they finally gave in because they th- saw that it was in their best and interest. And they also noticed the early crossover between music and gaming. And when they had yep. Marshmallow go in and, and do that. I mean, that's brilliant I strategically. Agree. It's brilliant from a community standpoint. Yeah. Um, it's really talking to your community and, yeah. and understanding what they want and giving it to them. So, Well, and in fact, side note, but um, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to PRG, one of the companies I work with. They actually produce those in-game concerts in Fortnite. Which so is fantastic. the technology. Thank you, PRG. Is, yes. Thank you, PRG, <laughs> for the paychecks and for the technology. Uh, so, yeah, I think you are exactly right that if we look at things from a community-based mindset, 
we grow from there. Um, I recently on my podcast had a gentleman named Michael Aguilar. Okay. He leads esports for University of Oklahoma. And his entire premise is you start with the community. You don't start with these varsity teams and on the stage and everything. Because guess what? Gaming is very broad. Right. In fact, the vast minority of gaming is competitive esports. And so while it's true that not everybody on a college campus is interested in esports, nearly everybody is a gamer in no, some no way. No question. A some lot way. of that is non-competitive. And so when you facilitate these uh, these relationships like you were talking about with these folks in, uh, in Brooklyn, Michael told an amazing story about how this couple came to OU. It was their first day on campus, and they had a World of Warcraft event. And they didn't know anybody, but by the end of that event, they were fast friends with 30, 40 other people. Right. And now you have community, now you have connection. And I think that's what really drives us as people, you know, as humans. And so it is amazing that gaming is the conduit to develop oh. and drive Incredible. positive relationships. Incredible. Thank you for coming. Thanks I for appreciate me. it. Um, love to continue this conversation. We'll do a part two uh, one of these days. I'd um, love to. And, and thank you for everything you do, and let's hope that gamers start integrating more uh, physical and mental health so that they have longevity and then they can pass it as a legacy to their kids as they continue to have them. I think it's on the right path and uh, very excited for how I'm seeing the, the space maturing. And just shout out to everybody who is helping to serve and support this space. I agree with that. I'll second that. Thanks, dude. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for listening. This podcast is part of the MAP Esports Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Please be sure to leave us a review and follow us on your favorite podcast player.